The work I'm about to show you is part hyperreal and part minimal abstract photo-based work. I've had time in my past with professors, critiques, or conversations where a few people have proclaimed, you can't do that. Cameras are instruments that are created and used solely to record and document reality. I chose photography as my primary medium to explore, express, and push hyperreality and abstraction to question what is real. This presentation, for the most part, will take you backwards through my journey here at AIB. This is an image here by Henry Peach Robinson entitled Fading Away from 1885. He was one of the forefathers of pictorialism. He was an advocate toward using any means possible to achieve a desired image. With this image here, he composited five negatives together to get this one image. Even earlier, we had Oscar G. Rylander. This is his image entitled The Two Ways of Life from 1857, just shortly after the discovery of photography. Some pictorialists would use lighting and darkroom tricks to achieve dramatic atmosphere, as in painting. With this image, he actually composed it of 30 different negatives. This is one of my images, entitled Lush. I was unknowingly taking a pictorialist approach. I employed some painterly and theatrical elements. The sky is photographed separate and then used as a backdrop. The foreground of the tableau still life is then assembled. While in post-production, I add, subtract, change colors, tones, textures, in addition to brushing in light and shadows to my liking. This image here was composed of over 140 different photos. In the next image, I'm going to show you just a close-up of a detail. Here I am working in my studio, so you can kind of get a better feel of what's going on. Up here we have the backdrop, we have the tableau, and I'm doing the assemblage there. Here's an image, going back to historical, by uh, Peter Henry Emerson, entitled Coming Home from the Marshes. This is in 1886. He was a little bit upset with the pictorialists and took a stance against them. Within a short period of time, our photographs were confused with and substituted for reality. Natural, straight, realist, pure, these terms describe photography that has no supposed form of manipulation, close to point and shoot. Emerson thought of pictorialist images as fakes. I contest the very idea that there is such thing as an unmanipulated photograph due to perspective, depth of field, exposure, lens to subject distance, color, tone, subject matter, context, etc. These are all manipulative choices. Here's another one of one of my earlier studios. Before I was doing the tableau on the table, I was doing it here in a box. Emerson would consider my hyperreal work to be fakes. Before all the montaging and post-production, however, my worlds were straight photography on film. The definition, definition of fact is something that has an actual existence, a piece of information presented as having objective reality and truth. These pieces, by definition, did have a physical objecthood and an actual space of existence and can arguably be nonfiction. Semantically, the photograph itself as an object also fits the definition. Here's a resulting photo entitled Loves Me Not. Jean Baudrillard refers to hyperreality as a reality that is constructed of reproductions or simulations and substituted and accepted as reality itself. This puts a whole new spin on what reality is, what real is. Psychologically, we can have our own idea of what reality is, based on our own geographic location, memories, experiences, culture, age, religion, sex, so many other countless factors. Baudrillard challenges the idea that we live in a hyper-real world that is composed entirely of simulacra. In the 1920s, abstract photography started growing a little bit more. Check modern, modernism in the 20s. This is an image entitled Composition Abstraction 
by Jaromir Funk. This was in 1922. One of the ways that photographers may be able to detach from the visual trappings of reality is to either push it, such as hyperreality, or to distort it beyond the familiar. Another person from Czech modernism in the 20s was Jaroslav Rosler, and this is the photo entitled Akt. This is in 1926, and just uses basic elements of line, shape, light, and shadow, but still using the instrument of photography, not limiting. By the 1980s, James Welling, attempting to get away from the banal practices of street photography, opts for abstract photography and chooses his favorite material, aluminum foil. His aluminum foil photographs here are sometimes interpreted by people as night skies or landscapes. When I create art, it is not a conscious effort to latch on to any current or past movements or styles. I am more concerned with expressing myself, bringing something new into this world, and making interesting images that arouse curiosity, evoke feelings, and or provoke thought while questioning truth and reality. For straight photography, I went where ideas go sometimes, the toilet. <laughs> Edward Westing called it beautiful, a beautiful sculpture, and Duchamp put it in a gallery. I use it as my studio. Here's one of my resulting images entitled Placid. I felt that it was ironic that I was able to suspend bathroom tissue sculptures in toilet water to produce a straight, natural, pure image that may become high art using a material that people wipe their ass with. This is not meant to be insulting to the institution of art, but rather a humorous approach. A piece from this body of work was recently chosen by the curator of the Whitney Art Museum. People love to ask what the material or subject matter is. As soon as I divulge it, it tends to defeat the idea of letting the work express itself and play with a spectator's sense of reality. Saul Lewitt says, it takes a good artist and to take new materials and make them into a work of art. The danger is, I think, in making the physicality of the material so important that it becomes the idea of the work, another kind of expressionism. So, what I did was I changed material and I experimented with other studio spaces. The photographer Sally Mann, artist, says, if it doesn't have ambiguity, why bother? The married couple of Robert and Shanna Park Harrison has their image here entitled Suspension from 1999. By constructing a photographic image, the artist tends to bend the plane of reality. Here's one of my images entitled Resumption. This is one of my tableaus where I hope that people are, are able to recognize that it's fabricated. It contains elements that are familiar and unfamiliar when in the, with an implied narrative. Gregory Crutzen's early images. It's untitled, but people know it as Robin with a Ring of Eggs. It's from 1993. Crutzen says, I strive to create that perfection through obsessive detailing through a weird kind of realist vision. Here's one of my images entitled Neglect. This piece was part of a series where I used found objects in nature as stand-ins to critique reality and human behavior. This image is by Susan K. Grant, entitled Sherry Box from 2000. Grant took great steps in research to delve into the depths of her dreams with doctors at SMU during sleep therapy. She then used the recordings of her recollections to reconstruct her dream sequences. People like to ask, where is this? I would answer amb ambiguously, at first, the state and geographical location of my studio. This is one of my images entitled Swing. Later I would share that they were constructed alter realities. They would ask, how did you do it? And a whole other series of questions. This seemed to take the punctum and studium out of it. David Finn agrees that the impact of the photograph for anybody who looks at it closely is heightened by all those unanswered questions. 
This is one of my recent skies that I fabricated. Art is about creating, expressing, and producing. I am interested in producing something that has not been seen before, something that cannot be seen, something that challenges our ideas of existence. This is a sky that is composed of nearly a hundred images. Skies are ever changing and morphing as water vapor. As soon as I move my camera to compose the next frame, the cloud has already changed all the way around. By the time I composite and stitch the sky all back together, it's a skyscape that never existed in the same space at the same time. Here's another one of my recent skies. People will typically buy the idea that this was a straight photograph of one singular skyscape captured in a fraction of a second. People don't second guess or question the validity. When people look at it, they say, it's a sky. When it's only an idea of a sky, that is constructed. Here's a detail from that sky from the center. Not sure, yeah, you can see just a little bit of peppering of birds in it. Here's an image that many of us are familiar with, <coughs> Rene Magritte. Magritte has made his point through his paintings and letters to Foucault. A painting is merely a painting, pigment on a surface that is just a simulation or a sign that points to its referent. Later in the 60s, Joseph Kossuth reiterated the idea and relationship between text, image, and object, and the phenomenology that each may trigger the same idea in one's mind. Magritte and Kossuth were working on the nature of our codes of perception. My first proofs were straight photographs shot through a 4x5 view camera on Polaroid film. Strangely, no one at the time questioned the validity of the image. Instead, I would get the question, where is this? Although there is no sky in the foreground of the studio is visible. Art can, however, represent truth in the sense of Einstein's theory, theory of relativity. If we do accept that our existence is based on perception, the production of art is a derivative of one or more artist's perception, and the act of viewing art requires and may alter our perception. Then what we believe to be true is enveloped in art. We may even find truth through illusion of art if we believe that reality is true, and our reality is based on perception. I'm going to continue to push and explore truth, reality, and existence. The French French writer and thinker Albert Camus said, if we understood the enigmas of life, there would be no art. So much of our reality and world is a product of our minds. There is no reason not to produce, probe, and utilize what is available, what consumes us, and what is far more interesting. As a spectator questions the truth value of my work, I invite the spectator to question his or her own fragile perception of reality. In the future, I believe that I'm not going to share so much of my process or how the image is created with others. I like to let my images speak for themselves. So when people ask, are your images real, true, fact? The answer to all is no. And the answer to all is yes. Isadora Duncan, the mother of modern dance, stated, If I could explain to you what I meant, there would be no reason to dance. And now I'll open the floor to questions. Thank you.